What makes the statements of the Fearbolds interesting is, of course, Peter Fearbold was one of the two unfortunate people who discovered the Range Rover on the morning of the 6th of December, 95. Well, that is apart from the rumoured document that contains a phone call to David Bright, which was meant to be around about 6 to 6.30, but that was said to be a typo. Also, there's a statement of Francis Fearbold, who saw a white vehicle and an F-Ridge Range Rover around the lane on either the 5th or the 6th, the Tuesday or the Wednesday. And William Fearbold's statement, who previously knew Tony Tucker. But first, this is the statement of Peter Fearbold. I am the joint owner of Whitehouse Farm, Main Road, Retton and Essex. The farm itself is a 130 acre farm. The only boundary road is the main road itself, which provides access to the main farmyard. All other boundaries are adjacent to other farms. I would say that the distance from which the road actually borders my land is between a half to three quarters of a mile. The main farmyard is accessed from Main Road Retiden and is serviced by two wide gates situated about 50 yards apart. I try and operate this as a one-way in and one-way out system for vehicles visiting the farm shop. I have owned the farm since 1966 and have always lived on the farm. The original house was knocked down five years ago and the new farmhouse was built on the same site. I live in the house with my wife, Frances Fearbold. I do not employ any staff in the running of the farm. I farm turkeys, eggs and straw. This is managed by purely myself and my wife. Otherwise, the land lies idle as part of the government's five-year set-aside scheme. This purely means that for a five-year period, I as a farmer cannot use the land for crops. I have one more year along. Running south from the farmyard, there is an unmade track, which is our property and runs adjacent to the main road, Retiden. The track is about 200 yards long and ends at a bridle path which is accessed directly from Main Road Retiden. The bridle path is called Workhouse Lane and this runs off the main road in an easy direction for about a mile, ending at East Hanningley Field Road. I use the farm track to access fields on the other side of Workhouse Lane. These fields are used during the shooting season from 9 to 1 o'clock by people wishing to shoot. Around 7.45 on the morning of Thursday the 7th of December, I was visited by a friend, Ken Jiggins, who lives in the South Woodham Ferris. Ken helps organize the shoots and works with me nearly every day during the shooting season. Ken visited me this day in order to go to the shooting fields in order to help feed the pheasants. This is something I do twice a day every day throughout the shooting season. When we set out at about 7.55, the same day, the weather was cold and light. There was a frost on the ground with enough of the frost on the vehicles outside to require me to defrost the windscreen on my Land Rover. I then got into the driver's side of the vehicle and Ken got into the passenger side. I drove the Land Rover along the above mentioned farm track in the direction of Workhouse Lane. I had to drive reasonably carefully as a recovering of snow along the track. I could see no signs of other vehicles having used the track. At the end of the farm track, I turned left into Workhouse Lane. I drove for about 50 yards up Workhouse Lane, which I turned right into a small access track, which is part of a shared access to Mrs. Fax's grass field and the eastern shooting fields of my property. The access track is about 70 yards long and there is a metal farm gate at the end, securing these fields. The gate is kept padlocked during the shooting season in order to deter poachers. As I drove along the track, I saw a vehicle, a blue-grey Range Rover, parked on my side of the gate. The Range Rover was stopped with his bonnet facing the gate and no more than 10 feet away. I approached the Range Rover in my Land Rover stopping about 15 yards from the rear of the vehicle. My first thought was that this vehicle may belong to a member of the fishing syndicate who sometimes use a pond on my land to fish in. 
The person who runs this fishing syndicate is called Gary King. As I stopped the Land Rover, I could see there was no way to get around the Range Rover to get to our fields. As I looked, it appeared that there might be someone inside the vehicle. I mentioned this to Ken, who then got out of the Land Rover and walked over to the driver's front window of the Range Rover. I saw him tap on the window. I saw Ken peer through the glass of the Range Rover. Ken then walked round to the driver's side of the Land Rover and said to me, there's two people in there and they're dead. And then he said, I'm going to call the police. While he did this, I walked over to the driver's side of the Range Rover. I was careful not to touch the vehicle as I looked in through the glass. I could see two males in the front seats of the vehicle. I could also see one male in the rear of the vehicle. The male in the rear of the vehicle was located behind the driver and slumped in such a position that the top half of his body was behind the passenger seat. I would describe this male as being heavily built. I could not see his face, but I think he was wearing blue jeans. The male in the passenger front seat, I would describe him as also being heavily built. A male who was white, and I would estimate him his age to be between 25 to 30. I cannot remember anything else about him. The male in the driver's seat was again heavily built, about the same age, 25 to 30, and white. I cannot remember what he was wearing. I can state that both the males in the front of the vehicle had facial injuries around the mouth area. There was an amount of blood around the mouth and nose and also in the chest of both males. I went back to the Land Rover and spoke to Ken, who by now had called the police on his mobile phone, when he got back into the Land Rover. I turned the Land Rover around and we drove back to Workhouse Lane where I turned left and back up to the junction with the main road, Retterdon, to wait the arrival of the police. The police arrived within six, seven minutes. The response was from a marked police vehicle containing two male police officers. I explained to the officers what I had seen and Ken and I returned to the scene. Only one police officer actually approached the Range Rover. I do not remember the index number of the Range Rover. I can only recall that it was an f reg vehicle. The last time I personally went to these fields would have been about 4 o'clock on the evening before, on the Tuesday the 5th of December, as Ken would have fed the ducks on the Wednesday evening and pheasants on the Wednesday morning. I have never seen the Range Rover before and I did not recognise any of the males inside the Range Rover. The set-aside scheme provides that any member of the public may use the land to walk across and there are various public pathways on the land. As a farmer, I own four shotguns and a rifle. One shotgun is a single barrel. The other three shotguns are all 12 ball double barrel over and under guns. They are made by Parazzi, Browning and Winchester respectively. I am a holder of firearm permits for each of these guns and each permit allows I may possess ammunition for these weapons. I've not used these weapons recently and I'm happy to consent to the police inspecting these weapons. I'm happy to attend court and give evidence relating to the above. I wish to add that when I first saw the Range Rover, I can state that there was no frost or snow on the vehicle and there was no steaming on the interior of the vehicle. I formed the impression that the vehicle had not been there overnight. And then on the 29th of the 12th, 95, Peter Fearbold followed up with another statement which said, I have been asked by the police for details of any persons who may use my land for the purposes of shooting game. In the course of supervising both duck and pheasant shoots on my land, I keep a list of persons who shoot on given days. The shooting parties are made up of six people on most occasions. There are times when the parties may be less. I do not have addresses or phone numbers for all these people, but I keep their names. There is usually a phone number for at least one of the people of the group that I use for contact purposes. I keep a list of these people in a small handbook which I can produce. Unfortunately, there's no actual statement for Ken Jiggins online uh, with the other statements. As it does state in here that Peter 
uh, didn't go to them fields uh, for that. Well, the last time he attended them fields was on the Tuesday, but it would have been Ken that would have fed the ducks on the Wednesday evening, uh, a couple of hours uh, before uh, the vehicle, the Range Rover, was apparently down the lane uh, around about just before seven o'clock, according to phone records or Darren Nichols's version of events. And also at the end, Peter stating that when he first approached the vehicle, there was no frost or no snow on it and there was no steaming on the interior. And he formed the impression that the vehicle had not been there overnight, obviously because he'd had uh, ice uh, and well frost on his vehicle, on his Land Rover when he went to leave. But as seen on one of the crime scene to courtrooms earlier uh, videos, uh, the reason for the no ice or no frost, in fact, um, on the vehicles uh, could have been to do with uh, the the trees on either side um, and also the sunroof being opened. Um, but there are a f- quite a few people that um, are in the belief that the, the, the Range Rover wasn't sat there from 7pm the night before and possibly the, if the Billy Jasper's version uh, of events is true and he dropped off someone at midnight and the Range Rover in fact returned at a certain point or was they were still alive you know with the vehicle running and still still alive inside of it till gone midnight then it wouldn't have been sat there as long as we think um, or in fact if according to uh, a certain James English interview with Carlton Nietzsche and he did mention the, uh, the morning and that was the deal in the morning. Whether that was a slip-up, I'm not entirely sure. Um, some of the belief that he just made the, the, the slip-up between morning and evening and the discovery and 6 uh, p.m. And, and a.m. But if there was, in fact, that was the time that they arrived at 6 a.m. in the morning for some sort of deal, that's what time they got killed. That could then explain the no frost or no snow, or in fact, if it has been sat there um, for all that evening and in fact just didn't have no frost and snow because of the, the trees around it. The next statement would have been from the 8th of December. That's from Patricia Fearbold, the wife of uh, William or Bill Fearbold. And she states that um, on the Monday, the 4th or Wednesday, the 6th, she cannot remember which one it was. She went into her bathroom to rent a bath between 7 and 7.30 and she heard the sound of one single shot from a shotgun. This was, this was definitely a shot because my husband has been shooting shotguns for at least 30 years and she used, she is used to hearing them. And she can only remember the sound of one shot and it came from somewhere at the back of the house. But she could not be more specific than that. I didn't think this was to be unusual because of where we live. There is always someone out shooting small animals. And where I live is next door to White House Farm, which is owned by my brother-in-law, Peter Fearbold. And he is the owner of a pheasant shoot. So an interesting thing she said there was uh, she's used to the sound of shotguns. Now, this is quite a common thing for anyone that lives around that area and could be one of the reasons why the lane itself was chosen. One of the crazy things I've always tried to get my head around was why they chose that time of the evening to be killed if, in fact, they were dead by seven or, in fact, dead by nine. Because the risks of bumping into someone that time of night if somebody like the fear i used to be the theory that whoever shot them left by the alternative lane and possibly collected at the wish pub or a vehicle left at the wish pub uh, but the risks of running into somebody a dog walker uh, any sort of person just out for a walk that evening it was snowing so there is less risk of bumping into someone but there is also the chance and if you are running in fact, wearing a balaclava or you're in fact still holding the weapon, the risks of bumping into someone are a lot higher than just to leave in a vehicle from the lane itself. But it again, rush hour, uh, vehicles 
still coming back from work around about seven o'clock time. Uh, it more chance of being seen leaving the lane itself. Um, but the Billy Jasper version of events, the midnight would make sense. And again, people wouldn't be surprised at the sound of shotguns, sound of shots that time of night with night shooters. And there is a mention of uh, night shoots within uh, Bill's uh, statement, William uh, Fearbold, which is as follows. I own half of the land of White House Farm and the bungalow, which is adjacent to the farm on the main road, Retterdon. About 12 years ago, I joined Progress House Gym, which is in Castle Lane, Hadley, Essex. I use this gym for the purposes of bodybuilding. During the time, I met another user of the gym called Tony Tucker. I had trained with Tony in the past. I've collected him from his house to take him training. I would say in those days, I regarded Tony as a friend. When I knew Tony, he was a carpenter living with his wife and I believe two children in Rayleigh, Essex. I cannot remember the address. I'm also aware that Tony worked for Nigel Benn and was controlling doorman for various clubs. At one time, he had a shop in Romford selling bodybuilding equipment. He either owned the shop or was the manager. I remember whenever Nigel Benn was boxing, Tony would lead him into the boxing ring. Tony left his wife and drifted away onto other things. I have heard that he was involved in the drug scene, although I've never personally had any contact with drugs or ever seen Tony with them. I haven't seen Tony for about 10 years to actually speak to, although about five years ago I did pass him on the road in Hadley. We acknowledged one another and then went our way. I believe Tony was driving a convertible XJS Jaguar. I'm still a member of the Progress Gym. I go at least once a week, but I've never seen Tony training. Since his early days, I cannot recall Tony ever visiting my home address or the farm. I've lived here for 30 years, but I'm sure he knew where I lived. Another friend who I've trained with in the past is Paul Wheatley. Paul's friendly with Tony Tucker. I was Paul's best man at his wedding. Paul has visited my home on many occasions and I would have assumed he would have told Tony where I lived. I am also aware of a person named Pat Tate. I may have unwillingly met Tate at the gym and I have friends on Canvey Island who have had their car stolen and bowl this man. I am also aware of the name Tate through car dealer contacts, again in the Canvey area. I have never officially been introduced to the man. I am not aware of Tate ever visiting my home or White House farm. Both me and my brother Peter are competent sporting shooting enthusiasts. We have both shot for England and have been able to introduce this facet of our sport into our livelihood. We run White House Farm Shooting Ground, which is as follows. The farm is a lake, which is used for duck decoy and fishing. The farm also contains a pheasant shoot. Peter looks after his side of the business. I run the shooting ground which is separate from the farm and is contained in the 11 and a half acres of Rowan's land. This is private ground, which I supervise and run to your tuition and have a down the line and compact sporting setup. The shooting ground is set up for sporting smooth bore shotguns. I also have an arrangement where I can supply shotgun cartridges to my customers. I currently stock two types of cartridge they are the Express 24 gram 7.5, colour mauve, and the Champion range from Kent cartridges, size 7.5, colour red. It is not uncommon for people who use my shooting ground to bring their own cartridges. I currently only shoot on a Wednesday, up until 6.30 hours. On Wednesday the 6th of December 95, the shooting stopped when it became too dark. I estimate the last shots were fired around 3.45. I do have lighting facilities to allow us to shoot after dark, but on the arranged date, it was getting cold and the last visitor had an interest in our lakes, so we went on to discuss my pond, which is beside my home. I am obviously aware of the shooting incident, which occurred on our land, just off of Workhouse Lane. 
The last time I visited the area was on Monday, on the 4th of December, when I walked across the land and up to Retterdon Hall around about 8 in the morning when I had a job to do for Mr Fax, the occupier. At this present time, I have three over-under 12-bore shotguns and two rifles. Should the police wish to inspect these weapons, I am prepared to hand them over. I should also say that if I have finishing shootings on the Wednesday afternoon, on the 6th of December, I remained at my home address all evening. I did not hear or see anything unusual. One of the main things that sticks out to me straight away there is the fact of Bill says there that he does his shoots on a Wednesday. The day of the murders, the day that the, 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 the people that chose to kill the three, it was the same day, conveniently, and also that the shoots would normally go on to 6.30 in the evening. And if we're led to believe that they were dead by 7, no one in that area would take no notice of any shots on that day, especially around that time. That could go to explain why the murders were chosen to take place at that time of, n- of night, and especially on that day. Also, there's a previous friendship between Tony Tucker and William Fearbold. And was Tony aware of that being William's land? And could that be part of why Tony was using it? Having previous knowledge of the land itself? Or in fact, an attitude of like, if he was caught using the land, he knew the person that owned it and thought that might help smoother over if he was in fact caught using that land. But it was Peter Fearbold's wife that witnessed a white vehicle and a Range Rover on either the Tuesday the 5th or the Wednesday on the 6th during the day. She saw the white car pull onto the property. She thought nothing of this at first, because the, but the vehicle was followed by what she believed was a green Range Rover. She took notice of these vehicles for these reasons. Firstly, they had considered purchasing a vehicle of the same type and also the occupants of the Range Rover were large white males. The statement of Francis Fearbold from the 20th of December is as follows. I live with my husband Peter and son Christopher at White House Farm resident Essex. The farm is situated on the main A30. I would describe as the farm layout as follows. We have two main entrances of the main road. There's a concrete vehicle parking area which leads into our two-storey farmhouse. We have a farm through which the shop we sell eggs, hay, straw and general farm goods. We also raise turkeys and sell Christmas trees. The farm is open between 9 and 5 in the afternoon. She runs the shop but sometimes insisted by a friend called Alan Newton who lives in Basildon. During the morning of the 7th of December... 95, she became aware of a shooting incident which has occurred in Workhouse Lane. The lane is part of our farmland. I'm also aware of a Range Rover motor vehicle which became involved in this incident. I have given this incident much thought and have been asked by the police officers if I could remember anything unusual and I could provide the following information. On Tuesday the 5th or the 6th during the day, I can recall seeing a white car pull into our property. I thought nothing of this, but this vehicle was followed by what I believe a green Range Rover. I took notice of this for two reasons. Firstly, we have considered purchasing a vehicle of the same type and also the occupants of the Range Rover were large males. We also sublet some of our outbuildings to two people, Mr Wayne Jackson, Mr Alan Howe. I am aware that Mr Jackson runs a business called Bellericky Bailiff Services. Therefore, because of the general demeanour of the occupants of the Range Rover, I had assumed they were going to call a Mr Jackson's outbuilding. I saw the white vehicle, of which I could give no further detail, drive in. It did not stop but continued along to the second exit. The Range Rover followed behind, and I formed the opinion that these two vehicles were together. Neither vehicle stopped and drove out of the gate and back onto the road towards the resident turnpike. 
I remember thinking, cheeky buggers, I have tried to put a time to the incident. It was daylight and it was not snowing. I believe that it could have been whilst Alan was helping my husband, which caused me to go outside to be in the farm shop area. If this is the case, it would have been Wednesday morning before 10.30. The Range Rover I saw was an f Ridge. There was at least two occupants. The passenger in the front seat had a cream-coloured sleeve. I have seen photos in the newspapers of the victims of the shooting incident. The people in the Range Rover were of a similar description to these. The passenger in the Range Rover had light brown hair. He also had what I believe to have a jowly fat face aged under 40. As previously mentioned, I cannot dis- give any description of the occupants or type of car described as the white vehicle. Well, there we have an f Ridge Range Rover sighting on either the Wednesday morning or the Tuesday morning with a white vehicle, which could go along with all the sightings of the white Cosworth that was seen various times throughout of the, the week and on the day of uh, the Wednesday of the 6th of December, the day of the, the, of the murders that took place on that evening. And what makes this interesting is we're led to believe that the lane was being shown to Pat, Tony and Craig on the evening of December the 6th by Mick Steele for the apparent plane drop. But according to this statement, if this is true, and that is the White Cosworth with the Range Rover, then they already knew that lane. And 100% were not being shown it by Mick Steele. But the question remains is, why were they at that lane at that time in the morning? 10.30, if, if it was the Wednesday, the 6th of December, at that lane, 10.30 in the morning, and then found there, murdered the following morning, whether it's 6 or 8 o'clock, as discovered, by Ken and Peter. If it was either the Wednesday or the Tuesday, just 24 or 48 hours before, that Range Rover was already at that lane. If this statement was shown to the jury, would that not put doubts in their mind on the story of Darren Nichols? On the apparent law by Mick Steele to show them the lane, which they clearly already knew, or was it just a coincidence that they drove very near to the lane that they would be murdered just two or one day later? In my mind, they knew that lane. And they were there that morning, maybe just to turn around with this white vehicle. The driver of that white vehicle is the mystery. The white Cosworth seen following them or the Range Rover seen following the white vehicle various times throughout that day. Was it merely just a friend? Was it Darren Nichols? How much involved in this is Darren Nichols? If not, clearly just the getaway driver, as we are led to believe by his version of events, the self-confessed liar. It's statements just like this one, with the sighting of the white vehicle and the Range Rover near the lane, just days before the murders, which throws doubt into any type of story that Darren Nichols gave to the jury and they believed which incarcerated two men one now released and another still doing time since 1996 and is still there for at least two more years and going on the description that Francis Fearbold gave the two men she saw driving this Range Rover was more than likely Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. 
and why they were there is just part of this mystery and part of the big picture and the jigsaw that is always continuously trying to be put together.